Welcome to our online service. We are so glad to have you with us. My name is Nathan and I'm the lead pastor here at Orange Baptist Church. We would love to keep blessing you and one of the key ways you can partner with us is by sharing and liking and subscribing to this channel uh, and sharing this content through a whole multitude of platforms uh, so that we might see other people blessed in the good news of Jesus. Another key way of partnering with us is that if you are blessed by this, that you might consider partnering with us financially here uh, at the work of Orange Baptist Church. And then one of the key ways to do that is through our online giving platform and the details for that are below in the description. We wanna be praying for you and we want you to connect with us. So if you need prayer at any point along the way, please shoot us an email at prayer at orangebaptistchurch.org.au and a team of people are waiting to pray with you and for you. And if you are ever in the local vicinity of Orange in New South Wales, please drop in, come and see us on a Sunday morning. We would love to worship with you and to celebrate Jesus together. Be blessed. And for today's Kids Spot, we're going to be having communion together. For many of us, we use photos to remember important people and events in our lives. We take photos for our first day of school, our birthdays, parties, 
holidays, anything that we want to remember. And we like looking back on them and remembering all those, imp- those important people and events in our lives. Now, communion is the same. We use the bread and the juice to help us remember Jesus and that he died on the cross for us. And he died on the cross for us so that we could have a relationship with God. And for those of us who trust in Jesus as our king, we like to do this together, to remember that together we are saved by Jesus. So we're going to have communion now together. If you need to go get bread and juice ready, that's fine. Um, Just pause the video, go grab it, and then come back and join us together. So the bread is Jesus' body when he died on the cross. Jesus said this, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So when we take the bread and we tear it, it's like Jesus' body on the cross when he, when he died. His body was broken. And he died for us. He died so that he could take the punishment for our sin, which is death. Now, before we take the bread and eat it, I want you to take a moment and talk to God and apologise for all the sin that we've done, for all the times that we have rejected God and hurt our relationship with him. Pause the video and mum and dad, if you need to, explain how our sin affects our relationship with God and with others. Now the juice. The juice represents Jesus' blood when he died. This is what Jesus said. This is my blood, and with it, God makes his agreement with you. It will be poured out so that many people will have their sins forgiven. So not only did Jesus die, but he rose again. He defeated death. And because of that, we, he can forgive our sins, and therefore, we can have a relationship with God. Now, that is something to celebrate. But before we drink the juice, I want you to take another moment and thank God for sending Jesus to die for us. Thank Jesus that he will forgive our sins, and he can. And then take a moment to thank Jesus for all the other things that he has given us. Do this as a family. Share together the good things that Jesus has done. This little meal we've had together today not only allows us to remember what Jesus has done, but it's also a promise of what's to come. One day when we're all together with Jesus again, we will have a big, massive feast where we can all be together with Jesus and just be happy and celebrate and be thankful that we are with Jesus. And that's one party that is worth looking forward to. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we could spend time today remembering what Jesus did on the cross for us. We are sorry for the times that we have rejected you, but we thank you that through Jesus we can have a relationship with you. Amen. Today's Bible reading is Romans 7 verses 7 to 25. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I find that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and though the commandment put me to death. So then, the law is holy 
and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did what did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognised as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Well, as you've just heard, this is a tough passage to get our heads around. Uh, So we're going to jump into Romans 7 uh, and uh, try to unpack this for us uh, and see what God might say to us. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to your word now, I ask that you would reveal yourself to us, that we might understand uh, the fullness in which we have been saved from, and that we might be led to a place of honesty within ourselves and honesty before you as to our own struggles, our own issues. And that in that, that we might savour the beauty of you, our Lord Jesus, giving thanks for all that you have done for us in saving us, wretches like us, and holding us. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you might do a work in us this very day, that you might bring about more transformation in us that we might walk honestly and openly with you, our King. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we come to probably the most debated section of the entire letter for the book of Romans, which is saying something considering that kind of Romans 9 um, kind of through to 13 there is is a difficult kind of section in and of itself. Uh, And to kind of think that chapter 7 is so hotly debated is a really interesting perspective. And and it really comes um, out of this, this sense of deep personal nature in which Paul is speaking of here in Romans 7. I I don't know if you picked up on this, but Paul talks about himself constantly uh, in the first person. And and he's not shy to reveal the fullness of his own struggles and his brokenness inside of that. And, And it's been that very nature that has caused so many scholars to debate what's going on. That, that surely Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, can't say some of the things that he says about himself now as a regenerate um, Christian, 
as one who has been redeemed and restored by Jesus, how can he say some of those things in which he says here? And so it's caused a whole range of different debate that perhaps Paul is uh, talking not of himself, but, uh, but a, um, a metaphorical someone else that he's just putting into a first person, or perhaps that he's talking about um, kind of his, po- his pre kind of conversion, that he's talking about himself solely in the past tense about when he was a Jew and a Pharisee in particular. Maybe he's not just talking about himself, but he's talking about the whole Jewish nation and he's talking about Israel and and, and their position. There's so much debate around it. But for me, as I read this, uh, I very much take it that Paul is talking of himself and he's talking of himself in, in, in a story in lots of ways. In response, as Paul has done so often in the book of Romans, he's, he's constantly um, answering questions, hypothetical questions that are no doubt real, particularly for the Jewish part of the, the Roman church, questions about the law and the likes that would inevitably be sprung uh, as Paul has been teaching. And and he does that again here, but then he answers them in his personal way in two sections. In the first little section from verses 7 through to 13, Paul talks about himself in the past tense as he takes himself back um, to what it was for him and the law, his relationship with the law, himself as both a Jewish man and as a Pharisee. But then you get from verses 14 through to the end and Paul moves from using the I in a past tense to the present tense in which he unpacks this struggle that exists for him as a man who has been redeemed by Christ, one who is fully and utterly devout towards Jesus and yet continues to struggle in his own sinful nature. Redeemed, restored, now a slave of God as we've kind of been talking about and Paul has been talking about in Romans 5 and Romans 6 in particular and he's talking still of his ongoing struggle struggles in the flesh. And I think that this is an incredible testimony from Paul to the church and one that should bring us a great comfort and yet one that sees these challenges as Paul did and kind of steals ourselves for this walk that is the Christian life. Uh, So I just want to get that up up front because I think it's really important for us to kind of see this and unpack it and understand Romans 7 because it's so vital for us. As I said, Paul begins like he has done so ever many times throughout the letter of Romans, dealing with a very real, I'm sure, but at this point at least, hypothetical question out of what he's been talking about in Romans 5 and Romans 6 in particular. And so here we're going to jump in and let's take a look from uh, Romans chapter 7 from the first first half of verse 7. It says this, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Certainly not. So, so, so out of all that Paul has been talking about, particularly now being liberated from the law, now being a slave of God and all of that, Paul, Paul is then answering this question, is the law in and of itself sinful? And Paul's answer to that is, no, of course not. Absolutely not, just like he always does. It's so definitive, and yet then he kind of qualifies it. So he's like, no, not at all. But let me explain that a little bit further. And that's what we see in this second half of verse 7 all the way through to the bottom of verse 12. Let's read it together. He says, Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity, 
afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment, put me to death. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Paul makes it really clear, at least in the first section here, uh, that the very purpose of the law was at least threefold. Let's try and track my thought here. So in the, in the very beginning, we see in verse 7 that the law defines sin. When he says, had it not been for the law, I would not have known what sin is. This is, this is the reality that the law becomes a means by which we discover what sin fully is. And here's why. When there's no law and everyone just does as they please, then it's all an individualistic basis that there is no higher standard in which we're accounted to. We have no boundaries that says this is how, well, this is right, this is wrong, this is how far, this is how short. But once the law comes in, it defines what is good and what isn't good. And when that law comes from God, who is in and of himself fully good because he's fully God and knows all things and is entirely good and love, he defines the law because he made everything. It makes sense. And so in giving the law, he defines what sin is. And Paul then recognises indeed what sin is. But more than that, it reveals the sin in us. The law reveals sin in us. Take a look here, uh, in particular uh, in this, from verse 8, when it says this. Oh, sorry, the second half of verse 7. He says, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So he... he Paul recognises in the law that he himself is sinful. And this is really important here because at this moment there would have been a sense in which, and we'll talk about it in a second, that Paul wouldn't have seen himself to be sinful. He would have seen himself to have been a righteous man. And, and why? Because he was a Pharisee. And being a Pharisee, it was all about the external behaviours in following God's law. But here he recognises at this moment that he himself has fallen short of the glory of God and that he himself is sinful and it resides in us. But more than that, thirdly, um, the law provokes sin in us, which is this really weird concept. Uh, so let's look at verse 8 and verse 9 together and I'll try to explain it. Uh, but you can see it pretty clearly actually in verse 8 and 9. Uh, that sin, that the law provokes sin in us. Look here. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded, uh, afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. From apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that every commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and so on and so forth. But here what happens is, is that Paul is talking about that he sees the law and that somehow inside of him, he's actually provoked to kind of sin. He sees the line and instead of going, okay, that's the line, he can't help but want to cross the line. He talks about sin as if it's something external to him and that sin coerced him or it deceived him in verse 11. And that's an interesting kind of phrase because I, when I read verse 11, my mind instantaneously is cast back to Genesis 2. That, that in Genesis 2, when Adam and Eve had all of the garden, and had God given them every tree full of fruit to eat, everything that was good. And then his commandment comes that says, do not eat of the fruit from the tree in the middle, the tree of life. Don't, don't eat from that. 
So the commandment comes and then so does the deception. When Satan comes and causes deception inside of Eve and at that moment there was the boundary that was there, a clear command of not to go beyond that and with this deception there was a moment with inside of Adam and Eve where they couldn't help but want to challenge it. Because here's the reality. None of us like being told what to do. None of us. No one of us likes having boundaries put into place. Or or we like the boundaries being in place, but for other people, we just don't like it when it impacts us. When we're told that we're being limited at one point. It's like driving a car. We all agree that the speed limits are a good thing that keep us safe on the roads, except for when we're running late. Right? That's why some of us have uh, a few less points on our license than what we ought. Or or, or think about it like this if you've ever had kids or hung out with kids, if you tell a small child not to eat something, but after you've pointed out that that food is on the table, what is the first thing that they do? They will walk straight to that table and try to take some. It's it's this innate nature inside of us that Paul has been talking about time and time and time again, that the moment God puts his good laws in front of us, we decide that we don't want to follow them, that no one can tell us what to do, that we know better and that we push beyond the boundaries. And, And inside of that, the law instead of what was good to protect us, we then treat as a means by which we have to figure out a way of circumnavigating it to still do as we please, creating sin. And this is what Paul is talking about here. This is how he's answering it. No, sin, the law defines sin. The law reveals sin in us. And the law provokes us in our sinful nature to want to sin even more than that. Daft, I know, but this is just the way it works for us. It's just a hard truth, but it's a truth nonetheless. And as we see here, there's some other sections here in this first little section that need kind of answering, Uh, particularly in verse 9. That's an interesting one because Paul says something really unique. This is what Paul says in verse 9. Take a look with me on, uh, on the screen here. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. What is Paul saying? How can he ever say that he was alive apart from the law? Well, I kind of take you back to what I just hinted at just a moment ago. Paul is saying that as a Pharisee and as a Jewish man, uh, that he, there was never a time where he wasn't under the law. So he, he was always had the law. He was born into a Jewish home. He himself was a Pharisee among Pharisees, followed the letter of the law. So how can he say that he was free from the law at that moment? Well, simply because of his external behaviours. He followed the letter of the law. There was, a, there was an idea, idea in all of the Pharisees that talked about that the law was something to be followed. It didn't relate to the internal kind of reality, well, at least until you read the very end of the laws. And here in particular, we, we look at the Ten Commandments. So Paul is saying there was a moment in which he was so good at following the law that he was free from it in the sense of the condemnation and potential death. Because he did everything that he was supposed to. When you go back into Exodus chapter 20 and you read the Ten Commandments, it's all about external behaviours until the last one that Paul himself addresses in verse 8. So he's in the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, for Paul, he didn't. It was only ever Yahweh, the covenant to faithful God, you shall not make yourself an image uh, of in any form, anything in heaven and earth or beneath the waters. You should not bow down and worship them. That was easy. You didn't bow down and worship another idol. That's fine. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Again, an external speech. Remember the Sabbath and keep it. So as long as you were good on, that, on the Sabbath day and didn't do and didn't break, it was all good. Honour your father and your mother. 
You shall not murder. Well, that's pretty easy to define. Did I kill someone today? Yes or no? Paul hadn't murdered anyone. Uh, at least yet, early on at least, because he kind of had a fair bit to do with kind of murdering of Christians. Uh, but here he says, you should not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You should not give false testimony. It's all external behaviours. Right, So there was a moment in which Paul thought that he was free from the law. But as you keep reading, he recognises that once that law hit him, it came down on him like a tonne of bricks. Because the external behaviours weren't the issue, it was the internal realities. And so in verse 9, he says that in the second half, he says, I sprang to life. Uh, so when the, when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. What was this sin? It was the sin of coveting because it was no longer about an external behaviour, but now coveting, as the law had given it, was this place deep within inside of Paul and all of us that says that we want more, but not just more for more sake, but we want more so we have more power and authority and the likes. So when Paul is talking about that the reality of coveting came into him, he recognised that he himself is fundamentally broken. This is no longer about his external behaviours. The law had revealed and defined and provoked sin all of that in Paul, and he knew it, and he knew the consequences of it. Even though these things, the law itself was good and it was holy, which is why he says in the very end of this section in verse 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. These were good things that the God had given because they were God's gift. The issue was not with God's gift, but with the people. It is the issue with humanity. And so the Jewish question surely then comes in verse 13. Again, another very real, but at this point, hypothetical question. When they say here, did that which is good, that means the law, uh, did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognised as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandments, sin might become utterly sinful. Paul is just reiterating that point. The law was always good, even though in the giving of the law, the reality of our brokenness and death became apparent the gift in and of itself is still good because it is from God. So Paul looks back in this past tense and addresses this nature with inside of him in relationship to the law. We need to look at this too. But more than that, Paul then kind of changes a little bit from looking in the past and he starts looking at his own life now in the present and the reality uh, uh, of, of, of the battle that rages now for him as a redeemed Christian man. Let's take a look for here from verses 14 through to 20. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this is this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Okay, so that's a mouthful and there is challenge in the midst of this. So I'm going to try and break it down. In the very beginning, in verse 14, he makes this statement. I know that the law is spiritual. In other words, that 
that it's a gift from God. So on the one hand, we know that there's spiritual and there is goodness because it is from God. And then he talks about himself as being unspiritual. That is that he is in his sinful flesh. So now we've got this this challenge between these two worlds, uh, the spiritual stuff, which is good and is given by God and the unspiritual self that is of the flesh. Here, now there is this challenge for Paul trying to balance these two things, even as someone who has been fully redeemed in Christ. At the heart of the battle is this gap, this gap in which Paul is living in between the old life that was in Adam and this new life that is yet to come in Christ in its fullness. So there's this gap between, uh, this overlap, I should say, between the time of Christ and the time of Adam and which Paul is addressing and saying, I'm living in this moment like we all are. People who have been redeemed by Christ, saved by his grace and grace alone that Paul has been at pains to labour in throughout the whole book of Romans. And yet, as he's done on many times, talked about the fact that we are still in Adam and, and we're still struggling in the midst of all of this. Paul is talking about this yet again. We are struggling in this in-between time where there is an overlap between our sin and our redemption in Christ that is longing for us to take hold of the full redemption when Christ returns and makes all things new. And then Paul then talks about his incredible struggles, his very normal Christian struggles with living in Christ and still being caught in these times of our sin and our flesh. And that's why Paul then unpacks that in verse 15. I do not understand what I do. He's confused, totally and utterly confused. Why? Because I, I do what I don't want to do. I do the things that I hate. These are the struggles. He's talking about the very real struggles of sin, He knows his redemption in Christ. He knows how he is to live. He's been given now the law of the Spirit. He knows that the the Ten Commandments are still very valid, but it's not just the external behaviours, but now as Christ had been at pains to say on the Sermon on the Mount that it's not just the external uh, behaviours, but now the internal motivations that go hand in hand with our external behaviours. And Paul is saying, I struggled even in the midst of this. I still do the things in the flesh that I don't want to do, that I know is not right, that is not good. And I'm I'm at pain in this. And you can hear this, this, this almost internal groaning, can't you? For Paul in his own struggles, he confesses this. As it is in verse 17, he says, As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. There's this moment in which he confesses and says, there's there's nothing good in me in my sinful nature. There's nothing good in me here. I'm struggling. I know when I look at myself outside of Christ and, and just in my own flesh, there is nothing that is good in me. And this here has been one of the reasons why people, scholars have thought that Paul isn't talking about himself here because he doesn't mention the fact that that he's now living in the spirit, now being redeemed in Christ and and that somehow these scholars are suggesting that it's, it's an unregenerate Christian. I don't think that makes sense, particularly this, this kind of builds into chapter 8 when Paul talks about the fullness of the life in the Spirit. I think before he's getting there, he's just being raw and honest and saying, in his flesh, not, not excluding that the Spirit dwells in him, but he's looking at it and just in his own flesh, there is nothing redeemable in him. He's struggling. He's still sinful here. And he still does it. That's why he says, I, I, um, good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not, for I do, not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, 
I do. I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who, who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. It's a bit confusing, but, but at the heart of it, he says, in my sin, I keep doing it. But then he starts talking about sin on an existential, uh, external kind of perspective to himself. He's not saying I am entirely sinful. He's talking about that when I'm doing the things I don't want to do, it is sin that is raging in me. He's talking about the separate part of himself now that he is in Christ. But a part of him is still struggling. So in other words, on the one hand, he's worshipping God and he's thankful to God and he wants to please God and live holy in God. But there is still this part of him in his own flesh and his own sinful nature that still even now wants to do the things and continues to do the things in which he's struggling in. And I think that is an experience that all of us, when you get past the, the do's and all the other bits and pieces in this, when you get to the heart of it, I think at this point, this is the moment in which every Christian goes, oh, me too, me too. I do the things that I don't want to do. I struggle in the flesh doing the things that I know is not good for me and that doesn't honour Christ. And I'm struggling in this. I know I'm saved. I know I'm redeemed. I, I know that nothing can tear me from Christ's hands, but I don't want to keep living like this. I want to keep living in freedom. But why? Why does my flesh keep taking me back in this? There's this war that is raging inside of Paul. And Paul talks about this specifically here in the next few verses in Verses 21 to 23. Look, so he says this. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Paul, Paul says it this way in, in Galatians chapter 5, 17. He says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want to do. Paul is saying there is a war that is taking place inside of us. Now, to be clear again, Christ's death and his resurrection means that overall the war is won. But as you can see, the battle still rages as we live in this tension and in this time that, that is overlapping between Christ and Adam. As we struggle, there is a war that is taking place within us from our own sinful nature that has been deceived. And what we know and what is good for us. And we can't give in to this. And while we hear these beautiful personal words from Paul, we are to take comfort here that, that if we are struggling in sin, then that is a normal part of the Christian experience. I, I, I've been in ministry a long time. And I remember working with a guy who in particular, who was just struggling with pornography massively. And, and every time he fell inside of this place, he's just like, he would meet and would talk. And he, I remember him holding his head going, why do I keep doing? I don't want this, but it just, I can't stop. What, what's going on with me? I just want to honour Jesus. I want to be free from this, he used to say to me. And that's the war that rages. And while there is comfort to know that we're all in this together and that we all struggle, it doesn't mean that we have this free-for-all to keep sinning. And we've talked about that in Romans 6. But we need the fortitude to keep fighting the, the, the war of the flesh. Even though we're going to fail at times, we keep getting up and we keep moving forward. We keep moving forward. We keep fighting for what is good. Because we know what we've been saved from. We know how good Jesus is. 
We know that what he wants is good and great and the best that we could ever imagine, even though our flesh would want to disagree. And so we have to keep pursuing this. We have to keep pursuing the fight for goodness in us. And we'll discover in chapter 8 that, that the only way for us to do that is to be connected with God himself, enabling the Spirit to keep working within us. But there's also this warning in here that is to be seen at every point, that with this recognition that, yes, we are sinful and we have fallen, so then we need to stop trying to relate to God on the basis of our own capacities to do Good. That just circumnavigates the whole gospel. If you think that you can try to do that falsely, there is nothing inside of us that can somehow relate to God perfectly because of our own capacities to kind of try to do good. Because clearly, even the Apostle Paul, in all, like, who, who had this Damascus Road experience, who knew the full nature of God and his whole word, and yet even that, he still struggled in his sin. Um, we will too. So we can't try to um, have a relationship with God on the basis of our own capacities to do good or to live morally. We have to keep fighting sin. And when we fail, we come before him. and We allow God to lift us up. We love one another, we serve one another, we help one another. Paul kind of finishes up this section with this incredibly raw moment. Take a look here in verse 24. Paul says this, What a wretched man I am. There is a man who is honest with himself who's looked in the mirror, who has allowed himself to study himself and his own actions and intentions. And this is what he's come to. What a wretched man I am. And then he says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Who's going to help me? Who's going to save me? Who's going to bring me through this? Verse 25 says, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. In looking at his own struggles, he does not lose sight of his salvation because his salvation is not dependent upon him his salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. His pursuit to live holy before God is because he has something. He has someone better than the old self that motivates him day after day after day after day after day to keep waging war against his own sin. And this is the beauty of the gospel when we see the glory of Jesus and we recognise who we are and then we celebrate as we have already done in communion, we celebrate his liberation from us so that we are no longer identified as fully broken people. We are now saints who struggle with sin, but we are saints because of Christ. And as we live in this moment of between Christ and Adam, we look forward to the time that is coming when it would just be the time of Christ, that we will not be impacted by this sinful flesh and desires, that we will no longer want to test the boundaries because it's not existential. We will have God and we will have see Jesus face to face and that will be sufficient. That's my hope. In my sin, it's those moments where I see myself and I understand that I am the wretched man. I choose not to feel destroyed in that and defeated in that because I'm not looking at myself but the King who restored me. And I'm thankful 
And so my heart longs for him to come or for him to take me home. I'm not afraid of death because I know what that brings. The hard thing is still living in this life, living in the tension. And the only way forward is for us to fix our eyes on Jesus and to draw closer to him, the one who saved us. We know what sin is. We know it resides in us, as it has always done. And we know that sometimes when we see the boundaries, we're provoked to sin. But when we know that Christ is king, we know we have someone better. So even as we struggle, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's pray. Lord, fix our hearts and our eyes upon you and give us the strength to keep saying no to our sinful flesh. That we would continue to fight the war that rages within us and that we would do so in your strength and in your grace. Lord, you change us from the inside out. But as we do that, Lord, we worship you, that you chose to save a wretch like me. What else can I do but praise? To you be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.